Welcome football fans, but most importantly, USFL fans to episode 26 of USFL A. What does the A stand for? Literally anything. See how that works? Anything. Athletics. Arbitrary. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It can anything. stand for whatever. Anything. anything. Literally the word anything. Yeah. So this is episode 26. We've made it this far. Uh, that's a lot of episodes. And we are breaking down the USFL 50. We've done two episodes of the USFL 50 so far, releasing the next week of picks. So if you watch the show, you get them early. If not, then you see them on Twitter, Instagram. If you're on stunt, that too. So let's get right down into it. How do you think the list has gone so far, Webb? I, I like it. Um, offensive lineman. There's too many kickers for me. but uh, Too many kickers. <laughs> I, I think one is enough. I think one of no is enough. But uh, I, I think they're... The list is really good, actually. Um, I think we there's a good consensus this year. Um, like I said, I believe last year we had way more players that I had to kind of divide and come up with the US of 50. This mm -hmm. year was a little bit more concise. So that 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 means that we probably hit it out, out of the park. So I'm uh I agree. I like it. I agree. It was last year it was kind of the final 10. It was yeah. a toss-up. It was oh, just yeah. whoever that person felt like putting. Where this year, it did feel like you almost felt like you didn't have enough spots yeah. for players. So it was more consensus. The only thing that I think has thrown me off completely was Reggie Corbin at 36. That was wild. That was the last one of last episode. That That's really far. That's the biggest drop that we've seen, I believe, from number nine to 36 in a season. Yeah. Even though he almost had a better season this year. Yeah, he did. The curse of competency, right? Once yeah. you start doing well, they just expect it from you. So that's cool. Let's see if this week there are any more surprises like that. Maybe somebody jumped up. Maybe somebody jumped back. Maybe somebody's on the list that we didn't even expect. So yeah. coming in at number 35, the first one of the day, we have Joshua Dunlop. Josh is a, what is he, a guard for the Panthers? Ta uh, yeah. Tackle. 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 He is a tackle. My bad. A tackle for the Panthers, he was consistently rated as one of the highest players on the Panthers by PFF. Uh, he's the guy who was blocking for Reggie Corbin. So it's cool that, you know, we had back-to-back -back Panthers. And probably one of the best parts of that offensive line, we talked about it before, the part of the Panthers' offensive line that just got ate up was the middle of the line. They really could not give Josh Love any time. And maybe that was a big part of his downfall, why Carson Strong came in, he didn't do well, and they had to have the mobile EJ Perry. But the outside of the line was not the problem. What do you think? Well, Dunlop's the only offensive lineman for the PFF that rated 70 or above for run blocking and uh, pass blocking, which is mm -hmm. crazy to think he's the only guy. So you'd think he should be the highest rated offensive lineman, and he's not. He's not. We have another one on the list today. Yeah, I, I think their offensive line was a work in progress, like a lot of offensive lines in the league. And Dunlop was pretty solid all year. I Like you said, Reggie had a better year. And Stevie Scott, you know, he got an NFL shot this year. Um, Josh Love had a couple great games. He had two offensive, offensive player of the weeks. Yeah, and the offensive line did its job for the most part. And, of course, the tackles are important. You know, they're, they're in the NFL, they're the highest paid offensive linemen. And Dunlop deserved it. And I, I really thought he was going to get a opportunity in the NFL um, just because he was the highest graded. So, obviously, he's doing something on tape. Uh, but 35 sounds about right. I agree. Um, he's one of those guys where when the offensive line as a whole doesn't perform well, he's going to fall a little bit to the wayside with them, right? So, there's probably going to be a Stallions offensive lineman who's way up there, even though he might not even have graded as well as Josh Dunlop. He may not have been as good, but he was on the Stallions. You ready to go? You all right? Yes. Sorry, I'm a little under the weather, and so I will be drinking water and muting myself <laughs> periodically. But yes, I'm ready to move on. Number 34, finally, finally, there's Pittsburgh Mauler. Finally, we've hey, taken, we still haven't had a gambler, so I don't want to hear it. We, we've taken 16 spots. 
to finally get a Pittsburgh Mahler, Josh Simmons, kick return, uh, wide receiver, extraordinaire, uh, return of excellence, one half of it. The funny thing about Josh Simmons was at the beginning of the season, no one was counting on him. Nobody opening, really knew who he was. The opening kickoff was taken by Trey Walker and Bailey Gaither against the Breakers. He wasn't even the opening kick returner. I don't even think he was active, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Uh, and then he obviously became the best kick returner in the league, all USFL. But the thing that I think a lot of people are sleeping on, his receiving. He only had 16 catches. He was only really involved in the offense the last, like, three weeks. But he had 19 targets. So every time Troy threw the ball his way, he caught the ball. He had a touchdown and the play of the year, the, the smartest play of the year when he was uh, stepping out of bounds against the Stars and got the ball to 50 right before the halftime, and they come in and score three points. So I, I think he's perfectly placed. I'm glad that he got recognition. I really believe he was on every single ballot. So He should be. To be the all-USFL kick returner, not only for the league, for us as well, for our network's rankings when we did them. Uh, like you said, he was a good receiver. He had some good long balls too. I mean, the dude is a burner, and he's got – Good hands. Usually when you see a receiver who is fast and who is a kick returner, you're thinking more of a Deshaun Jackson. You're thinking more of a Ted Ginn Jr. These are guys whose hands weren't that great, but yeah. they kept them around for a long time because they were that fast, because they were good in the returning game. Josh Simmons has pretty good hands. He's like a legitimate receiver. So to be that total of a package, and like you said, to nobody thought about him at the beginning of the season, almost not even the coaches, he wasn't even active, to then prove himself so well so quickly and then consistently for the rest of the season. Yeah, he absolutely deserves to be on this list. I might even put him higher. Yeah, uh, to go back to the – when we went up there for training camp, I couldn't keep track of Simmons because he just had like a random number on. Like he didn't even – like I didn't even know his name. Number. Yeah, it, it was just like a random number. He looked – I believe he had a linebacker's number, like a 55 or something yeah. like that. It, it wasn't his number. Um, it just – he was an afterthought and developed into one of the key players. And, like, when the Maulers offense, which doesn't score a ton of points, I know I could talk Maulers all the time. I, I see you're Probably. already looking up. But <laughs> if you if they're getting – he's getting the ball to the 50 every single time. They don't have to move the ball as much to get into Chris Blue at range. He was a perfect weapon for them. So I'll move on. I'll move on, I'll no, move I on to number 33. But I do want to move on because number 33, finally, I get to say it. Finally – a Houston Gamblers, my boy, Kalen Tolson. Absolutely love this man. Everybody knew him from the Carolina Panthers uh, training camp where he did the white chicks dance um, as what Tyrone Biggums from <laughs> white chicks. He is such a good dude and quietly one of the better linebackers in this league. Uh, if you look at him, he was fourth in tackles in the league. Yep. Uh, he had 76. He was, I think he was up to like second place in the league in tackles at one point, but then obviously Frank get, Frank Ginda and Kiavitz Zeno went way overboard. But to look at it, you look at the three people ahead of him in tackles. It's Chris Orr, Kiavitz Zeno, and then Frank Ginda in that order. Those are the three guys that everybody was talking about. They should get the NFL shot. They were all, everybody was talking about them for defensive player of the year. Chris Orr a little bit less because he got hurt. But as far as getting an NFL shot, Chris Orr was definitely on everybody's list. He was playing like an NFL linebacker. Kalen Tolson was right up there with them in stats the entirety of the year, and nobody would talk about him. Nobody, which doesn't make sense. The guy has everything you want. He's just not as tall as you want. He's strong, he's fast, he's smart, and he's always going to be at the ball, obviously 76 tackles in an eight-game season. And for some reason, people just didn't talk, to, talk about him, which is strange because he is also younger than all three of the guys above him by three years. So... He's a guy who legitimately should be looked at by the NFL because he got into a training camp, didn't make it, came into the U.S. felt, did well. He should be the guy that then gets the look and goes up. But sometimes that's not how the cookie crumbles. But I love Kalen Tolson. I absolutely love that he's on this list. Um, man, just good to see that he got recognized. And my first gambler. Let's go. I'm so excited, dude. I get to post about it. Uh, just been retweeting him. And I'm like, I just want to post one. I, I, I completely agree. I get uh, Simmons tomorrow, so I'm excited. Um, Tolson was the most underrated linebacker in the league. Uh, yes. With Chambers and Bingham being highly rated in the PFF grade on the edge guys, Tolson was cleaning up all their messes when they were missing the tackles all, the oh. entire season. Uh, Tolson 
deserves to be on this list. I had him at number nine. So that tells you I, I love defense. Uh, you know that. I love I linebackers. I, I had him at number nine. Um, I, I just think he's awesome. He's sideline to sideline. He cleaned up all the mess that the, yes. off, the defensive line doesn't get to. Um, I, th- I think he's decent in coverage. I, I really like him. I, I know he's undersized, and that might be his his knock. I, I guess the same that thing he said about knock. Simmons, right? His size, yeah. size, ma- size really matters in the NFL. Like we see it all the time. Yeah, we just saw Bailey Zapp really get cut because of his size, right? And same thing with Matt Corral. Yeah. The quarterbacks, the NFL, it matters a lot. So um, Tolson is one of those linebackers that maybe a second year does help him to get into camp, kind of like a Ginnon to Zeno. So yeah. Tolson coming back could help his stock. And if he can produce these numbers, maybe improve on them like Tazino and Ginda, you know, he gets his shot. So, yes. Um, I love the way that you said sideline to sideline, because the first game that we played the Stallions when we won, not the second game, let's not talk about that. But when we beat them, you know, we were starting Terry Wilson, at quarterback, and literally I had a coach text me before the game. It was uh, like the day before they announced that Kenji Bahara was going to be out. And he texted me and he said, Hey, Terry starting, get ready for a tough one. And I was like, oh boy, like the coaches didn't even believe in it. But a big part of it was that Kalen Tolson is so much faster than they had scouted or believed he was that a lot of the time when Alex Magoo was moving out of the pocket and doing Alex Magoo things, he was right there because he is that fast and he can move sideline to sideline so quick that he was always covering him. And I think Magoo only had one good long run that game where Kalen got, you know, taken out with a block. But he just, he's always there as an insurance. Like you said, if the defensive line isn't going to pick it up, he's going to be there to clean it up. Uh, Just a trustworthy, quiet guy that people just didn't talk about. Maybe he needs to start screaming more and get mic'd up. I don't know. (laughs) Sometimes. Hey, he's in front of Diggs, right? He's in front of Diggs. Heck yeah. He screams all the time. So he's he's good to go. Ready for number 32? Number 32 on that team that you hate so much, the Philadelphia Stars. We have quarterback Case Cookus coming in at number 32. Now, this is a fall. Um, I didn't look up what he was last year. Did you write it down? I believe he's number 12. Last he year. was number 12, and he fell 20 spots. That is wild for a guy who still put up 2,294 yards. I mean, a prolific offensive season. Their defense really just wasn't good. Yeah. Again, not good. But I didn't think it was a 20-spot fall. Oh, I, I completely agree. Um so I've had a long history with Case Cookus, uh, going back from our polar opposite days. Man, you just, you've hated him. You loved him. Then you I hated loved him, him. Then I hated him. Yeah, we, we've had an on and off relationship. At the, at the beginning of the play, uh, the season, I said the Stars are going to be the worst team in the division. They were close. They were close. And then I started to feel bad for him because the offensive line wasn't protecting. And then they got better, and then I didn't like him. And then he had, and then he had the number one receiver in the league with Coleman yeah. and, yeah. and uh, Gray and all this, like uh, the passing. And then I liked him again. And then I just realized he's Philadelphia, so I don't like him. But he is properly graded here. I think he had a quieter season. I don't think he was carrying the team like he was last year. Quieter uh, season? No, but it, he had he had Coleman. You know what I mean? Like he had he had some hel- he had no running game. I'll give him that this year. Yeah, the running game took a major step back. But I just think he falls victim to you know we've already seen this before. So true, true. Okay, I, I can believe that. And I, I I think he's properly rated here because it was it wasn't like he did anything crazy. The guys in front of him did some things that were crazy. And I think quarterback play, I I'm, it's my guess that he's probably the third best quarterback in the league, right? And that's yeah. at number 32. Last year we, we had Sloter, Tiamu, like we had Jamar, like they were all in like the top 15. This list is more balanced, and I think Cookus is properly rated because if you if you consider it like eleven starters, right, on offense, and I know this is just an offensive list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The third quarterback should be about thirty three, right? Because every team, first team, second team, okay. third team, and I know okay. defense is there, and quarterback carries a little weight to bring him up. I I think Cook is properly rated, even though I can't stand him. I get what you're saying, but I mean, the dude still had almost 2,300 yards. That's second most in the league. He had 15 passing touchdowns to nine interceptions, which isn't great, but it's still better. You know, the only two that I would say are, you know, head and shoulder above him would be McLeod, Bethel Thompson, and Alex Magoo. So those guys are probably, you know, one of them's up there, up there. But the other one probably top 15, then to fall to 30, 32, like, okay, okay. 
Still, put some more respect on this man's name. He had no offensive line, zero run game, basically one receiver because the rest of his receivers never stay healthy. The guy is just, he's putting it all on the line out there. I, I love him. I think he is the working man's quarterback. Like, you just got to love the way he puts it out there. That's that's fair. I I love and hate him. So, moving on to number 31. I'm ready to move on. Number 31. This one, we were talking about it before the show. Yeah. So, um, Probably a guy who made it on this list because of PFF, which this is the first year that we had pro football focus doing actual grades for players. And Kyrie Woods absolutely got the best end of that deal when he was the highest graded player in the league, like overall, I believe, for the yeah. entire season. Uh, he didn't play for half the season because he was injured, but he was consistently graded in the 90s. That got him on everybody's list. And now he's number 31 in the US 1250. What do you think about Kyrie Woods? Yeah, he's definitely an analytics dream. Um, yeah. The money ball kind of th- people that are out there, which we did have a lot of voters that paid attention to the PFF um, this year. It's crazy because I was writing down his stats. 18 tackles is less than two a game. I know he didn't play all 10 games, but like that is still not top 50 numbers. I had Kyrie because yeah. I fell victim. I, I, rated him high on the list. I believe he was like in the 40s for me because of his PFF grade. Um, his coverage was solid. Uh, 20 targets, 13 catches he gave up when the coverage was in his area, which is kind of crazy to vague. like, yeah, it's very vague because like vague. what what can constitutes, if they're not playing man to man, like. Yeah, it's like you're playing man, himself. they're crossing yeah. and the guy that's being covered in front of you catches it, but you're technically yeah. in the area. Like that's Yeah, and, and, and when when it comes to safeties, it just doesn't make sense to me. But it gets it gets gray. Yeah. His, his PF grade was PFF grade was the the highest like you said over 92. It was I believe like an average only, 92.6 or something. Yeah, I, I believe there's only three people in the league that had 90 and above. And I think both of them are in front of him. So for he he graded high, analytics dream. Number 31, I guess that's fine. Yeah, I I don't know. I honestly think Troy Warner deserved to be higher than him. If we're going to talk about the safeties on the showboats who deserve to be on this list, I think Troy Warner absolutely deserves to be higher than Kyrie Woods, especially the fact that Troy Warner led the team in tackles. Troy Warner played the entire season. Kyrie Woods was out half the time. I get it. You don't want to hold injury against them, but at some point, like you have to when you come up the other guy. Like, yeah, when was there. you're coming up on a list like this, you have to hold injuries against them because yeah, it, it, it is production. We're not, we're not like I don't. Yeah, think it's like he had two great the, games. But I don't think cool. anyone went into this ranking. Levi Bell number two. You know he's on the practice squad. Or number three, he's on the practice squad. Or uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or Brandon Aubrey's number one because he made the NFL. It it's not. Yeah, I, there's no disrespect to Kyrie Woods. It's just production does have to take an effect and. 31 means that a lot of people fell in love with the uh, PFF grade and rated him high. And well, I will say, like you brought it up, the Levi Bell thing. I'm glad that we did this list and got most of the ballots in before a lot of the NFL signings had happened. Yeah. Because uh, I think Levi Bell, you know, he made it on this list, which he deserved to, because that is what got people to look back at his stats and realize, wow, this guy did things in the couple of games yeah. he played. Whereas last year, Micah Abernathy was on the list. I don't even know if he was on my list. He really wasn't that impressive in the USFL, but he gets signed to the Packers. He goes and has great preseason game with them, and suddenly he's on everybody's USFL 50 yeah. list. I'm glad that we did it this year before all the NFL signings, where people really were basing it just on what they saw in the USFL. Yeah. Right? Not to say I don't love Micah Abernathy. I love that guy, but I, I prefer to have the USFL bias than, oh, this guy went and played in a bunch of preseason games, even though he never played in the USFL, you know, things like that. But talking about somebody who did play in the USFL, coming up at number 30, finally, the second gambler of the night, Avery Genesee, Coach AG. Absolutely love my man, number 74. This is a guy that has all the Texas background, all the Houston background you need. Man, gamblers fans should all know this guy's name. He was drafted to the original gamblers back uh, before season one. He came in, he played at Texas A&M, where he played for season one coach Kevin Sumlin. Then he was in the XFL, you know, before, sorry, the original XFL. He was on the Roughnecks back when they were cool with PJ Walker and stuff. So, you know, he was good back when he was on that team. Now he's on our gamblers. He like he had a decent season, season one, 
kind of rotating a lot with Brandon Hittner. This season, he really took over that role. He had a shaky beginning of the season and then really picked it up. In weeks three and five, he was one of the top five graded players by PDF, PFF, not PDF, by okay. PFF for uh, the gamblers as a whole. I thought our offensive line was arguably the best one. Mark Thompson had the 14 touchdown season. You know, all these things don't happen if our line isn't solid. And I think that Avery was a big part of that, protecting the blind side out there, playing tackle. Oh, love this guy. I absolutely love Avery Genesee. Um, been talking about him since season one, and I'm very, very, very glad that he made it on this list. Yeah, I, I think he's one of the top free agents in the US of Don't talk about that. Oh, <laughs> not, D Day is I, coming. When it comes to offensive line, though, he is one of the top guys that have been around for two years. 100%. Um, him and Calvin Ashley probably are the top yes. two guys. And Genesee finally gets recognition. I'm surprised he didn't make the list last year because they were able to run the ball last year with Thompson. I know Thompson was real low, and this year he's going to be really high up on the list. But really high. I, I think, <laughs> I think uh, Genesee deserves he's recognition. He's a big part of it. Yeah, uh, the offensive line was solid. You guys have had offensive line. Um, and to have a years. consistent offensive line for yeah. two seasons, to have consistently good play, uh, yeah. especially early on in season one. I mean, obviously that didn't go into the deciding of this, but Avery is just a solid, solid uh, cornerstone on that offensive line. So it's, it's deserved, that. and it shows that, what, Mav didn't even vote for offensive linemen, and yeah. we still had one this high at 30? Like, come on, man. So. Yeah, well, a Avery Genesee is one of the best, and like I said, top free agent because, yeah, or top two year player because that offensive line was solid all the way through, and he was one of the cornerstones, and yeah. he should get every recognition possible. I believe he was all USFL right this year. Yes, he wasn't last year, um, no. but Thompson had a bigger year this year, so obviously the offensive line gets more recognition. I I'm a big fan. I believe I had him a little bit higher than this. Not much because we're starting to get to the, you know, it's it's real tough to, you know, the top yeah. 20. They tell the difference, but I, I think he was in the 20s for me. So, Yeah, and then, like you said, he's been in the league for two seasons. Uh, yeah. His contract is about to be up in October. We'll see how things fall, but I'm really hoping that he stays again. Because he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't get an NFL shot last year, right? No. Okay, so he is a free agent. Unlike yes. Cookus, Cookus is not a free agent because he did go to the NFL in the fall. So ridiculous. Well, our last player, who I, he's not going to be a free agent, right? Because he resigned. He is. No, he is. He, he is a he free has agent. Not resign. Oh he boy, yeah. I got to get on this train. We're talking about Mister Trey Tarpley. We got Arnold Tarpley the third for the. Pittsburgh Maulers coming in. Number two. I love this picture of him, too. I think that's such a cool picture. Made a great graphic. Um, Yeah, he's your guy, man. I'll let you talk about him. Tarp is uh, the unquestioned leader on the defense. Uh, if you listen to Jaron Horton and Ray Horton talk, the safeties are the most important person on the field for their defense. He's telling people where to go all the time. Interceptions. The only thing I will knock on him is that 80-yard return. Boogie gave him some. That was one of my highlights. Boogie was interviewing him in the middle of the game, and he said, <laughs> uh, what happened? Why'd you get tired? And yeah. Trey, Trey just uh, ran out of gas. But eight pass deflections, which I think is very underrated because he's very a safety first of all. Um, number one was Mark Gilbert. Number two was Trey Tarbley. Number three is John Atkins. So he was the best safety in the league. John. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, he had like five in one game. But yeah. Tarp is a, uh, you talk about free agency, but Tarp is a Pittsburgh kid. I don't know if you know that. Came from, yeah. Uh, yeah, I interviewed so. him I, back when we interviewed him the first time on uh, on our show, but yeah. in season one, I was there. And if you want to learn how to manage your credit, follow him on Instagram as well, because uh, he's uh, always giving out credit tips on his uh, Instagram story. But Tarp, Tarp is a brilliant mind and um, one of the leaders on this team, on the Iron Guard, on the best defense in the league, and. He would have been on this USFL 50 if he didn't get hurt last year. Yeah. Um, and I think the all USFL, he was going to be the safety last year, and then he got hurt, and then they put Bryce Tornan on. Um, not to discredit Bryce, but Trey is the leader on this team. He's You can, he's you a, can, tell. You can tell he's better. And, he's better. I think it's um, funny you bring up the, uh, the credit thing because he did tell us 
before getting into the USFL, when he thought his football career might be over, he was selling insurance. So I, I remember this interview with him well. It was a good one. He uh, was in the hotel in Birmingham before season one during training camp. Great dude. And I love to see him get on this list. Uh, the dude flies around. That interception was great. Not his only interception. And yeah. my favorite thing is he's not that big. Him and Bryce, both are pretty small yeah. dudes. Yeah. And they come up and they hit like a truck. So yeah. if you do that, that's my favorite thing of all time. The dark visor, everything. Like it, just, oh, yeah. it, it fits the whole mold of the Iron Guard. So they're so um, cool. Tarp is definitely, I think I had him right around here. I know there were a few people that had him in the top 10. I will say that. Really? Um, yeah. So he gets the credit. Well, when you're second in the league in interceptions and pass deflections, you have to be doing something right. True. And then you had 40 tackles, right? For safety, that's four a game, four or five a game. You know what I mean? 42 yeah. tackles. So he's definitely one of the leaders. And at 29, it's perfect for him. So agreed. I, I actually like this group of players. I'm get, I'm glad we didn't have a guest host on this episode. Yeah, we don't. We have two for each of our teams. Uh, no guests. And then... You know, the, the, the other three are all different teams. So I like this group. This was a good group. No stallions and and no uh, generals. And there's got to be a star for me to complain about. So, it's yeah, good. no stallions, no generals. Yeah. Oh, this is a good this is a good list that we got this week. Exactly. I, I like this list a lot. I exactly. see more Mullers and more gamblers in our future. Yeah. But for now, this is the list that is coming out for the next week. And if people aren't watching, they'll see them on all of our socials. Go follow the uh, United Football Media at United Football Media on Instagram, which is where these are all getting posted, and they're collaborating with you know whatever team that the player is from. And then obviously follow all of us on Twitter because we are just a rambunctious, crazy group of people that like <laughs> to post on Twitter. Before we go, Baylor winning this week, and are they covering? Dude, they one hundred percent should be winning this week. We play Texas State. It's it should be a big win, but knowing Baylor, um, yeah, it could be close. I don't know, but well, I hope that we blow them out. There is a Pittsburgh Mauler, well, the rights on Texas State staff. So, Lindsey Scott Jr. is the uh, offensive assistant. True. So, yeah. I had well, hopefully, hopefully we, uh, we beat them down so bad and stop their offense so bad that he's like, wow, I don't want to be here. And he just kicks out and goes and signs a contract with the USFL. Well, well, we'll see. We got Troy. We're all right. I know. I know. We're all right. But. but this has been our list. Man, it's been a fun list. This was a quicker episode, which my throat very much thanks you guys because, wow, the flu season has been hitting hard right now. But this was a fun one. I cannot wait to be posting my guys this week for the first time. You're posting your guys this week for the first time. It's going to be the college football's back. It's a good week, guys. It's a good oh, wait, I'm I, sick. Post, I'm sick. I posted one this week. Which I one did you post? Reggie Corbin. Oh, my gosh. Whatever. He's not going to be a mauler. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> okay, and that's what we'll end it on. We will see you all next week.